and welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. We've come to the end of the first year of Nintendo Power with issue number six for May and June of 1989. This is going to be another great issue, and who the hell am I kidding? This issue has a lot of sequel content, by which I mean it's not covering sequels to games that were earlier, by which I mean we are, for lack of a better term, just covering games that we've already covered. So, either either it's stuff that's been previewed earlier in the magazine, like Bayou Billy and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, where the, or it's something where it's actually had a feature article earlier, and a fairly in-depth one, but it's getting expanded on even further, like Life Force and Ninja Gaiden. So, this could be a shorter episode, though the next couple will probably make up for it. So, let's get started. This issue's cover features the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the art style feels like the cover artist is trying to emulate Eastman and Laird, but content-wise, it looks like he's also trying to emulate the cartoon show, which feels a little like trying to emulate Adam West's Batman with your content, while also using Frank Miller's art style. It doesn't quite mesh. In the letters column, we have an interesting recipe for a punch mix themed for Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, using two cups of strawberry Kool-Aid, two cups of raspberry Kool-Aid, a box of frozen strawberries, and two cups of ginger ale. I'm presuming that's pre-mixed Kool-Aid. This recipe sounds interesting, but the strawberries just add too much sweet for me. Actually, if you're going to do this, what I'd recommend doing is, instead of using that ratio of strawberry and raspberry Kool-Aid, I'd recommend using black cherry and blueberry Kool-Aid, and drop the strawberries entirely. That would give some nice tartness to it, while you also have the black and blue thing going on as well. We get a continuation of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles strategy guide here, but as I've already reviewed this game last time, and there isn't particularly anything new to discuss here, I'm just going to move on. Next, we have the winners of the Nintendo Power Awards. For the games I've already played, I'll give a little video with the voiceover, which makes for all the games. For best graphics and sound, we have Castlevania 2. I can't argue with this. The game's soundtrack gave us bloody tears, and the graphics really wouldn't be exceeded until we hit Castlevania 3. For our best challenge and best character, we have The Legend of Zelda. I ag also agree, The Legend of Zelda is difficult without actively trying to kick the player in the genitals. Yes, technically Zelda 2 won for best character, not Legend of Zelda, but they both won for the same character, and Legend of Zelda is a superior game, so there. Nah. For best theme and fun, best ending, and best play control, we get Super Mario Bros. 2. Mario 2 has a real sense of character and flair to it, and the music kicks everything up a notch. The game also has really solid, responsive controls, and a cute ending, though I wouldn't say it was as good as, say, the ending to Ninja Gaiden. For best player versus player, we have Blades of Seal. Well, duh. Finally, for best game overall, what in the nine hells? Seriously. Zelda 2. For best game. Oh, what the hell is wrong with you, 1989? I demand a recount. I demand that Nintendo of America go back, find all the ballots from when this was, from when they originally did this, all the, everything going back from 24 years ago, and I want a recount of everything. Absolutely every all of them. There's it can't have been Zelda 2 as the winner. It can't. I mean, seriously, if you're doing a best of awards thing like this, you gotta use a ranked voting system like the like the one used for the Hugo Awards. It, that way, you avoid situations like this. Hopefully, Ugh. let's keep going before this this sets off my heartburn. And we get more coverage of Bayou Billy, so let's just keep going more. Okay, now we have coverage of Cobra Triangle. Next! Then we revisit Life Force. Um, yeah, I beat the game when I covered it the last time, and considering last time I talked about this game and showed gameplay, Konami put a copyright flag on the video. I'm just gonna move on, so I'll just show the nice maps this issue has of all the levels in the game and keep going. Ah, something new! Mega Man 2, the sequel to a game which reached the top 30 in spite of not being featured in this magazine. While the article doesn't give us maps to all the stages, nor the boss order, as this is a preview article, we do get some nice glimpses of the stages. 
Now from a gameplay standpoint, Mega Man 2 is an interesting and solid game. The controls are excellent with precise controls to back up the precise jumps, and the levels are equally well designed and very creative. Not only are they challenging, but they're interesting to play through, and visually they all play off of each of the boss's themes very well. And because of the whole Robot Masters and their gimmicks, the Mega Man games in, games in general have done a really good job of designing levels that justify the gimmicks of the bosses and the gimmicks of the levels themselves. And so even if it's just a generic fire level, ice level, or water level, it fits with the boss that you're going up against, and in turn, the weapon that they'll be using on you later on. So it really feels like they put a lot of thought into the design of the games. If I have one complaint with Mega Man 2, it's that several of the levels of the game feel like they were designed with trial and error gameplay specifically in mind, and frankly have never been a fan of that style of gameplay, just on a personal level. A good example of this is with Quick Man Stage. As you travel through the stage, you find yourself descending through a section with rapidly moving beams of energy which kill you on contact. In order to get through this section of the game, you need Flashman's weapon, the Time Stopper, which means that no matter what order you take on the other robot mast masters in, you have to take on Flashman before you take on Quick Man. Then, once you get to the section of the level, after you've turned on the Time Stopper, you can't turn it off. You may want to turn it off in sections that you can navigate with minimal danger to preserve the power for the weapon, but you can't. Further, while the sequence of the level has a weapon energy pickup, it's really not enough to make you make it all the way through this section, so there's a, thus you have to get through a portion of the end of it with the time stopper no longer functional, thus you are on your own. Still, this is a definitely an incredibly enjoyable game and really worth picking up and giving a shot in whatever fashion that you can find a copy in. We then have the NES port of another one of the games in the Dragon Slayer series, Xanadu, released in the on consoles under the title of Fuzanadu, the Fu part of the title referring to the Famicom system that this was originally, re originally released on in Japan. You get the game's experience chart, and we also get the weapon and armor power-up information. From a gameplay standpoint, Fuzanadu does a lot of things right that Zelda 2 did wrong while still having some other issues with the game. Like Zelda 2, the game is entirely a side-scrolling RPG. But unlike Zelda 2, the game has no overworld map, instead staying entirely in this side-scrolling perspective, like with Castlevania 2. Now, unlike Zelda 2, the character's attacks have a fluid animation to them and reach, so even if you're attacking with a dagger, you feel like you're able to attack at a distance. The game also has an upgrade system for weapons and armor, so you have a noticeable improvement in your ability to attack and defend yourself. However, the game does have some noticeable faults. Like Castlevania 2, the game has some significant platforming s segments, and not all of them are particularly well thought out. These sequences require precise jumping, but without the precise controls needed to carry out those jumps. Additionally, for some bizarre reason, your character can't crouch. Instead, enemies that are below your character's waist have to be killed with magic, or if you're out of magic points, jumped over. This makes for an odd design decision, in my opinion. Also, like Zelda, un like Zelda 1, the screens don't scroll. Now, for rigidly defined dungeons and top-down overworlds like that game, that's not really a problem, but for a side-scrolling action platformer like this one, albeit one with role-playing elements, this is a very significant issue. All in all, I do like this game more than Zelda 2, but not by much. Actually, if this game were to be remade with better jumping controls, and a way with the, dealing with the problem of not being able to melee attack smaller enemies and scrolling, i definitely give this game a full recommendation. As it stands now, though, I just can't recommend it without caveats. We then have Fester's Quest, the only game this issue to have been featured on the Angry Video Game Nerd, aside from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We get a bit of the music for the Adams Family theme in sheet music form, as well as some gameplay notes. Honestly, from a gameplay standpoint, Fester's Quest's sin isn't that the game is unfairly difficult, nor is it that the controls are clunky. It's that the game is boring. It's not that it's difficult, and yes, I'm using a game genie to record gameplay footage, but I didn't use a game genie to play the game for review. The problem is that the game just feels too simple and straightforward. Yes, there are mazes um, on the overworld, the sewers, and in buildings, but they're not particularly complex mazes. 
And this all isn't helped by the fact that in the Top Town segments, the game appears to be built on the same engine as Blaster Master, or at least what Blaster Master used for its um, Top Down segments. And also some of the enemies, like the Faceless Frogs, appear to be reused from that game, or at least their sprites are. The weapon animations even feel like they're from Blaster Master with the same wave and spiral shots that that game had and the same sort of upgrade path. Honestly, this game has none of the humor and creativity that went into the original Adams Family, and this is a franchise that just isn't served with a mindless, characterless action game like this one. Just skip it. Clash at Demon Head is the second game in Nintendo Power thus far to have been referenced in Scott Pilgrim. It's also something of a non-linear game, sort of, with multiple routes of the game's finish. This is an interesting game. It has a lot of exploration and non-linearity to it, combined with a system where you earn money from killing enemies to buy better weapons, among other things you can spend it on. The main character, Bang, also has some distinct character traits to him and his character design. He complains when he takes damage, or when the character bangs his head on the top of the level. The enemies also are certainly distinctive and fairly unique in their designs. The game is also one which really benefits from note-taking by the player when playing due to the opportunities to backtrack to grind for money, or because of tips dropped for the player in dialogue, like where they can get gold to trade in for money, or find additional shops of char or characters who will assist them. However, because of this particular kind of non-linearity, the game is oddly difficult. Most of the power-up items in the game are obtained through shops, not through set locations like with Metroid, where you find an area you can't get to, and you know, okay, I need a power-up item to get here. Once I find the right power-up item, I'll come back. You then find that power-up item, and then get a, tu a designed little tutorialized section of the game, where you get to play around with that item a little bit, and see how to use it, before you then have to basically go through the rest of the game, and use it sort of on the fly to get through areas or whatever you need to do in the game. Also, kind of oddly, the game's password system is set up where you have to use an item to get a password, and it's an item that you have to spend money on, money on in a shop. On the one hand, this means that if you have this item, whenever you need a password, you've got one. On the other hand, this means you have to plan out your sessions for the game more, because it does, you can't rely on, okay, I have to fall back to this NPC to give me a password, so I can pick up where I left off. Or, I have to, um, I don't know, um, I, I, or I have to stop playing now, so I have to induce a game over. So, consequently, if you want to really pick up where you left off properly, you, and while you're grinding for money for other power-ups, you have to make sure to set aside enough money to get a power-up item, so that once you've gotten the item you need, you can then spend, or your, or it's a power up, or whether it's a weapon, um, or what have you, then you can use your power up item, or you use your password item, so that you have a password that if you game over and have to stop, you can pick up where you left off with this item. Um, now that said. This wouldn't be as much of an issue if there was a situation where, say, you could game the password system, like with Mega Man, where you could figure out what means what and work with that to get, put yourself in a situation to, I don't know, exploit the game. But interestingly, nobody's done a password guide online as far as what chunks of the password mean, so I can't point you out a way around this. Um, that said, if somebody knows how to game, kind of game the password system, for fun, profit, and getting through the game a bit more easily, uh, please let me know in the comments. Still, this is I, I did have fun playing this game, and I'll definitely give it a recommendation. We have another RPG here with the US release of Dragon Quest 1 as Dragon Warrior, so renamed because the title is similar to an RPG from TSR called Dragon Quest, which is sort of a, flat, a fast play version of the Dungeons and Dragons rules. Oddly enough, there's also a British role-playing game called Dragon Warriors, and I'm not aware if there's any particular legal issue with that and the UK release of the game, but then again, at this particular time, I believe this was when Gary Gygax was out of TSR and Loretta Williams was in, and as part of her policy, she was 
freaking suing everybody. So I can understand why Nintendo was probably willing to be a little willing to, to go back on this and just skip that whole mess in the first place. The article discusses the premise and has some nice art, but unlike the other games in the preview section, we have no gameplay information or screenshots here, so I thought about this a bunch, and as this game gets a much bigger write-up later, I'm going to skip the game for this issue and get back to it when it gets the full write-up. In Howard and Nestor, Nestor has been brought onto the set of the Ninja Gaiden film by a pretentious Italian director to be a technical advisor. Now, now Nestor fouls up the role, as is to be expected, but fortunately Howard is the stuntman playing Ryu, so it all turns out for the best. In Counselor's Corner, we get hints on how the player can find the anti-tank guns and homing missiles in Cobra Command, as well as advice on beating Wizrobes and Dark Nuts in The Legend of Zelda. The guide for Ninja Gaiden continues, but as I've already reviewed that game, I'll move on. There's also another piece of fiction here in the vein of Captain Nintendo, with a kid pulled into a video game to help out Link. The top 30 of this issue gets a little fuzzy, as it says that Super Mario Bros. is new to the top 30 when it's merely just re returning. I checked, I've been keeping track of this. That said, Ultima and Techno Bowl are new to the list, along with Bad Dudes. Father's Day is coming up as of this issue, and Nintendo Power has advice for games for you to get for your dad to play. Or for him not to play and you to play in his stead, whichever you prefer. In classified information, we have the sound test for Ninja Gaiden, along with a way to make up for the climb walls ability that the US version is lacking. There's also some str strategies for Ultima related to when you should level up and how you can get party members resurrected for cheap. In video shorts, we have a look at Super Dodgeball, featuring the main characters from River City Ransom. There's also Fist of the North Star and Monster Party, which is one of those games which I'm really surprised made it through Nintendo's normally draconian censorship policy. In the NES Journal, Nintendo is starting their own chain of stores. Before the Apple stores, there were the World of Nintendo stores coming to malls near you, featuring NES games, peripherals, and systems. In movie news, Tim Burton's Batman movie is due to come out. Yay! Also, the GoGo -Go 13 comic is coming out in the US, and they're hyping it without any knowledge of the actual content to be expected into that comic. Admittedly, Duke Togo's vanilla missionary position in Woman on Top Sex isn't exactly ero exotic, or for that matter, erotic, but considering as this is the age before the internet, and considering this comic is being released without the Comics Code sticker, and will probably be uncensored, if some of the younger readers of Nintendo Power get copies of this comic, this might be their first exposure to female nudity. Also, the article misspells the Gekiga movement in manga as the Gekigaka, and conflates it with graphic novels and manga in all their forms. I realize this is an American magazine that came out before manga got big. Still, if you're going to go the extra mile and try to expose readers to a new concept through your article, like you're clearly trying to do here, you might as well check your facts and make sure you've got them right. In our celebrity profile, we have an interview with Holly Robinson, star of 21 Jump Street, alongside Johnny Depp. According to IMDb, she's still acting, and even had a cameo appearance in the recent 21 Jump Street movie. She is currently on the sitcom Mike and Molly. Well, in the game proposal win um, contest that we had earlier, they picked a winner, and the winner is some guy named Jeffrey Stott got Campbell with his game Lockarm. If that name sounds kind of familiar, that's because he's all more, com more well known now under the name of J. Scott Campbell, creator of Danger Girl. In Packwatch, we have a look at a bunch of upcoming games for the NES, along with another look at the Power Glove. No, I'm not playing the clip again. And a look at Broderbund's U-Force, their own little motion control peripheral. And with that, our first look at the Game Boy. Well, all the games we covered this issue were single player, so only one pick this issue. My pick here is Mega Man 2, with Clash at Demon Head being a close second. Both games are really solid, and they're definitely worth your time, but I like Mega Man 2 a little more. Next time on the Nintendo Power Retrospective, well, there are a whole bunch of games that made the top 30 that weren't featured in Nintendo Power or the Fun Club News, so... Next time, I'm going to get started on going through what I like to call the best of the rest for Nintendo Power's first year. I mean, I'll be doing something like this in later years, depending on how the top 30 for each year shapes up. 
So let's take a look at the number of games on the list. Hmm. Well, um, we have 33 titles on the list. Um, I don't want to spend too many episodes on this because otherwise we'll be this show will just become the best of the rest first year. I have to split this up, though, into three episodes, with 11 games per episode. I'll be cramming stuff together, but I think I can make this work. And if I can't, well, then you'll find out next time on the Nintendo Power Retrospective. If you enjoy the show, please click the like button and subscribe. And don't forget to post in the comments on your thoughts on the picks for Nintendo Power's first best of list. Ugh. But yeah, I'll see you next time. Oh, 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 oh,